we want to talk about a few things about a blown in uh, wall job today. The first thing when we walk on a job, we want our installers to look at the job and see if there's any safety concerns they have. If the framers have left wood laying around. Um, this house is a slab on grade so we don't have a staircase. So my guys don't have to worry about staircases. But the first thing we want to do is do a visual inspection of the job site to make sure we're clear to work uh, in a safe environment. The next thing we do because it's a blown wall job is we want to see if our bottom plate is exposed. And you can see on this job site we have blown the uh, framing debris away from the sawdust away from our bottom plate so that we can do a proper air seal on that bottom plate. We will caulk that bottom plate to the concrete as part of our job today. Um, nothing sells a, a blown in job to a contractor quite like having your guys show up with a leaf blower and blow out his cavities and blow the sawdust out, into the, out, out of the house for him. The contractors love to see that and it makes the job go easier as the, for the installers as well and you're able to do a, a neater job. The next thing we do after we see, establish we have a safe environment and we've moved the sawdust away from the wall, um, typically my guys work in twos, pairs. So I'll have one person start foaming the house, um, usually on stilts or on a ladder, while the other person cuts the, the netting for, for the wall. Um, so if we could, let me go through foaming just for a minute here. One of the next things we tell our installers is the importance of wearing their safety equipment. So we want to have our PPE on as we start foaming a house. So we're going to catch any place where we see light. Like I've got plumbing here and that's, you can see light at the bottom. So I'm going to foam that light to make sure I've plugged up that hole to stop the air. One thing we, have, one thing we impress upon with our installers is that the first part of a good insulation job is stopping air from being able to infiltrate the home. So we're going to do all of our foaming, penetrations down, penetrations up. We've started to foam this cavity. This is a great cavity as a sales pitch for blown in insulation. You can see my gas guy has scabbed together three layers of OSB to have his gas line at the right depth. You can see I've got a plumbing line coming in right here that we're going to foam around to make sure we get it sealed up tight from the outside. And I've got an electrical box here and on a 2 by 4 wall we always foam behind that electrical box just to make sure we get a maximum R value behind that electrical box. If you kind of follow this cavity up, we also have a, a penetration that goes into the attic. And to, to stop air for both thermal protection as well as for fire safety, we always foam the top penetrations of the house. Also, if I have, a, if I have one of my guys is working off stilts, he will catch the top of the windows as he goes around. I can reach these from the bottom, so I'll foam the windows as I go. When we're foaming, we want to start at one point of the house and work our way around the house. That way we're not hitting, missing um, parts as we go. It's really easy to miss a penetration if we're kind of jumping all over the house. So our, we, we instruct our guys, start at one point of the house and work your way around and catch everything as you go. Today we'll look at this little section of wall um, like we wanted to mesh and blow it. I'll catch this cavity here because I've got an electrical box that is almost against the sheeting. So I've sealed all my penetrations going up, I've foamed my windows, I have foamed the one penetration I had going down where I saw light. So now let's talk about the netting portion of this job. Typically because we work in two-man crews, one person will start with the foaming while one person starts hanging the netting or rolling the netting out. There are several ways to cut the, the fabric for the walls. Typically we start, if we're right-handed, on the right-hand side of a wall. We overhang about three inches or so. It's nice to put a hammer tack there so it keeps the net up. So if someone is working on stilts, it's easy for them to grab. Also is a good starting way of keeping our uh, starting point where it should be. As we work down the wall, we use our hand to hit the studs, kick the net along with us, and we roll this net out so that it's tight to the studs. We cut the netting and then we're ready to start hanging the net. Let's talk about the tools that we need to hang fabric on, on a wall of a house. We start with a pneumatic gun. We prefer the long rail so that you open this up. It will accept two rolls of staples at a time. Less loading means more time hanging net, more efficiency. We obviously have a compressor that is out by the power pole with hoses run into the house. 
Some other tools that you're going to need as you hang fabric on the wall is a screwdriver and even those pliers. Occasionally these guns do jam and will require a little bit of work. Sometimes as you're hanging net on a wall, they've used a nail plate, which you won't, will not want to staple over. It will cause a jam in your gun or hurricane straps occasionally along the trusses. Things to watch out for as you're running the staples. One of the nice things about the pneumatic guns is they have an adjustable feed rate. So I can adjust how fast the staples are shooting because this is an automatic gun. When I pull the trigger, it shoots staples. So as you're starting to learn, you want to start out with a slower feed. The more experience you get, the faster you get, the faster you'll turn that, that knob up so the more staples and the faster you can go. One other thing you'll need as you're hanging fabric on a wall is a good set of safety glasses. This is a pneumatic gun and it is shooting a staple. Let's get ready to hang some fabric from the wall. I've attached my air to my gun so it is ready to go. I usually set my compressor to 90 degrees PSI. If you set it higher than that, you run the risk of blowing out your seals and shortening the life of the gun. I'm going to start from my right because I'm right-handed. I'm going to overlap the corner about three inches to make sure I have plenty of room as I work my way down. You'll notice as I come across, I use the factory edge of the, the fabric and I come across the bottom of the top plate. I usually will staple from my hand to the right as a safety precaution. One of the reasons that I use the bottom top plate is so that I leave the top plate for a gasket foam. Um, this particular contractor has his gasket foam, his exterior walls. Before I move my ladder, I will do down the wall as well. You'll notice that I stretch the mesh with my left hand and use my right hand to staple. Once again, before I move the ladder, I will do everything I can from this height so that the rest can be done from the ground. All right, now that we've got the top of the wall meshed off, we can work on the bottom. We'll move our ladder. And I'll continue working my way down this right side. Once I've stretched the mesh, it's easy just to go down the studs with my automatic gun. Okay, once we have stretched the net on all four sides, it's a matter of just stapling off the studs with my automatic gun. You can see as we've hung the fabric from this wall, we've gone right over the window. When we plan for a job, we plan for about 20% waste in fabric from going over the windows and over the doors. It's a lot faster to do it this way and a lot less money than trying to piece in pieces around there. You notice the wall that we hung fabric on today is a nine foot wall. When ordering fabric, I will typically order in nine foot, eight foot and 10 foot lengths. That way I've covered most all the wall dimensions that I get. You can see as we hang the netting, we try to get our staples about an inch to an inch and a half apart, which will do a good job of hold the, holding the fabric to the wall as we blow it. Another reason we keep our guns at 90 PSI is so that we don't drive our staple through the fabric, which causes the fabric to lose contact with the stud, which causes material as I blow the cavity to blow over the stud. That has to be cleaned off, otherwise we have bulges in our drywall. If our PSI is set too low, we have staples that don't drive all the way in and are proud of the fabric. That also costs time for the drywallers. So always try to have your gun set between 80 and 90 PSI so that you're driving your staples in flush with the stud but not through the fabric. You'll notice that my, our installer Rocky leaves a little bit of uh, fabric at the end of the cavity where he staples it up and he staples it up so that it's easy to pick up later. You'll notice that 
that Rocky starts on his right and works his way to the left as he hangs the net. And that by stapling it to the wall, it's at the height he needs to quickly pick it up and move along. You'll notice that he never puts the roll on the ground, but he cuts it vertical so that he's able to uh, just keep ro rolling as he rolls around the house. Rocky's using his hammer tacker to tack the perimeter of the netting, and then he'll come back with his automatic gun and do all the stapling. Sometimes a wall is higher than the netting that you have. So Rocky is going to show us how he installs a piece at the bottom to make a nine foot netting work on a 10 foot wall. When stapling up net, it's always important to make your splices or your ends meet on a stud so that it can be stapled off properly. He uses the last cavity to stretch his material. By using that last cavity to stretch the material, he's not trying to stretch the material and hammer tack right next to his hand. It's a lot easier to get a tight fabric that way. You'll notice the installers, when they want to be quick, they will tear the top off the box, which leads the staples easily to a, easily to lend, a, lend a hand to. Our, our guys will also use pouches that will hold these staples where they're still easy to get to. Today we're setting up to blow walls, um, a little bit different than a setup to blow an attic. Um, we've turned our machine settings down. We also have stepped from our four inch hose down to a three inch hose down to a two inch hose. Some people will use a metal nozzle that will help them to insert into the wall. Um, my crew prefers just the two inch whip. You'll notice Miguel uses a razor knife to cut the fabric to make it easy to insert the, the hose. You'll notice as Miguel is blowing the cavity, he sw moves his hose back and forth to get a nice even flow of material in the cavity. One of the reasons our crews like the long two inch whip is they can insert it into the cavity all the way up, get the top of the cavity, that way they're only making one hole or one belly button. Once again, every crew is a little bit different on how they like to blow and how they set up. You notice Miguel likes to have a razor knife in his hand so he can cut the material and insert the hose. And it is a good idea as you're blowing cavities to have a hammer tacker in your tool belt because occasionally you will have a blowout over a stud. It's extremely easy to fix if you have a hammer tacker in your tool belt at the time. Once again, you'll notice that as Miguel blows, he uses that hose to whip back and forth, give him a nice even coverage in that cavity. As you'll notice as he removes his hose, he bumps the machine, which, al which allows us to fill the cavity, and the belly buttons do not need to be touched up that way. We call them belly buttons. Some people call them insert points. You'll notice a few things as Miguel continues to blow our walls. The first thing you notice is how the cavities are full but not overly bulging. That allowed the drywallers to get a good fit with their sheetrock. When Miguel is done with this wall, we can come back with the inspect our gauge and double check our densities to make sure we have enough material in the cavities, but not too much material in the cavities. The inspect our gauge is a great tool for blowers to use when they're first getting used to blowing walls. After someone becomes more accustomed to it, um, the inspect our gauge does not need to be used as much. One of the other nice things about blowing fiberglass in walls is you can tell it's not a very messy process. When Miguel finishes this wall, we'll broom it down, sweep the fiberglass against the wall, it makes cleanup a, a cinch. One of the nice things about using a longer whip or a longer metal tube when you insert it in the netting, you can see Miguel is blowing a 12 foot wall. He doesn't have to use a ladder to blow the top of the cavity. Today we're working in the southern part of Utah, which is a warm, dry climate. Our wall will be done as soon as we broom this wall. 
in higher elevations or more moist elevations, sometimes a vapor barrier is required over the netting that can be easily applied after it's blown. As Miguel blew that wall, you notice he would look up as he blew it. One thing nice about the Owens Corning fabric is that as you blow that cavity, you can tell by sight you're getting close to your densities as you lose the cottage cheese look and you end up with this nice smooth, smooth look. Mm -hmm.